Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. With South Africa having marked 30 years of democracy, Terence Screamer joins me to talk about the highs and lows of the real economy over the period and what could be done to reignite these important sectors. Hi Terence. Hi oh, Chanel. How would you describe the performance of the real economy since 1994? I think the performance has mostly been uneven, but also a disappointing over the period. You know, we've had periods of strength, mostly linked to commodity cycles, uh, up cycles or super cycles. But even there, we missed some of those. We didn't invest in the infrastructure in time to really take advantage of th those uh, super cycles that came quite soon after the, uh, the, the democracy came into South Africa. And uh, we also had a focus on a redistribution uh, in the mining sector that was important at the time, but I suppose when you're doing a lot of corporate activity, uh, that meant that we weren't really focusing on, you know, growing the sector at the, uh, in an alignment to what was going on, say, for instance, in China. For instance, our, our competitor mining economies such as Australia really hitched their wagon uh, to that boom in, in China, so we sort of missed those. And then, you know, more recently, it's been a real difficult period. You know, the, uh, the manufacturing economy, its contribution to gross domestic product has shrunk massively from about over 20% to around 12% currently. That's a relative contribution, but it's, it really hasn't punched its weight and it's really struggled to adapt uh, to the sort of more competitive environment that we entered in post-1994. And our industrial policies have been, you know, haven't really been very effective, initially not really having one, and then more recently not really being very effective. And then, you know, uh, agriculture has been up and down as well. And, uh, and really the, the signal of how poor it has been more recently, I suppose, is the construction sector, which is a major input into the real economy. And that is all but collapsed in South Africa with only one major construction companies still listed, a general construction company still listed on the JSE, the others having become much more niche and focused or have really set up elsewhere. What are some of the external factors that have influenced the performance of these sectors? Now, as we uh, integrated into the world, the world was globalizing and liberalizing and that was the big mega trend and I think that was really difficult as we integrated uh, during trade liberalization, our manufacturing sectors that had been built, some of them behind quite hefty barriers, really struggled to find their feet post that. And some have been able to do that and have been successful in exporting into the world economy, but many haven't. So that was a, a sort of a mega trend that we've partially navigated, but uh, and we are an open trading economy, but haven't fully navigated particularly on the manufacturing front and have underperformed really I think in mining and agriculture there with the, with the openness. I think agriculture could have been a major boon to rural development and job creation in rural areas and because of an, there were a number of uh, factors that uh, affected that but internally looking at you know around uh, the security of land tenure etc that made the farming quite or investment in farming it was a weight around that and then, of course, mining, I think the lack of infrastructure has been a major theme. But, uh, you know, there's also been the global financial crisis that came in 2009, uh, 2008, 2009. That really, we've never seriously recovered from that. Uh, we just haven't grown since that. And that's, you know, more than 10 years ago. Um, and so that's been a major external factor. And then more recently, obviously, the COVID lockdowns had a major deleterious effect on our real economy. There have also been some major own goals. Yeah, the major own goals, you know, initially I think not gearing up for the commodity super cycles that came and getting our rail infrastructure in particular in place to take advantage of that. But, but more recently, you know, load shedding is the biggest own goal that we've scored against ourselves over the last decade and a bit. And that has really crimped investment and really undermined the real economy generally. All businesses have been badly affected. But, uh, you know, uh, companies in that manufacture, that mine, and, and uh, also that farm really need stable electricity supply. So that's been a, a major problem. And then obviously the state capture era crisis, which really 
uh, hollowed out key state-owned enterprises um, and really made them non-fit for purpose in terms of the real, what the real economy needed and to attract investment. Uh, and those are still in repair mode, really. And that's been a, a real uh, major impact on, whether, on investment. And we've seen this lack of growth and job creation now for over a decade. Really, it, it's very much linked to that own goal of state capture, which we, we haven't really extricated ourselves from. So that has been a big problem. And then more recently, visibly, as the, the freight logistics crisis is a real problem for the real economy. And that, again, is going to require some years to get ourselves out of. And now we see the looming water crisis in a number of areas. And that will really, together with load shedding, freight logistics, this, this one could really hit business hard, obviously society hard, but could also hit the real economy that needs these basic building blocks. It needs stable power supply. It needs stable water and potable water supply. And uh, you know it needs freight logistics system that works. Fortunately, uh, the road uh, system, which is really in private hands, has sort of closed the gap somewhat in the freight uh, side, but it's not enough. And we really need our ports and our railways to be working much more efficiently. So those have been, I think, in the last decade, what uh, post the global financial crisis, it's really been about these own goals that have led to very low levels of investment in the real economy and, uh, you know, sort of bad outcomes. What could be done to reignite manufacturing in particular? Yeah, I think we, uh, one opportunity that looks, uh, you know, near term is that we know that we're going to be entering this massive energy transition. The world is in it and South Africa is at the start of it. So we're going to be uh, investing heavily in wind and solar in particular in South Africa. Those are the cheapest forms of new electricity that are going to come into the system. We're obviously, that has to be balanced in some ways with, com uh, with uh, electricity that, that can be used very quickly to fill the gaps when the, the wind is not blowing and the sun is not shining. So there's obviously going to also be a battery, a big battery rollout. Uh, we have pumped storage schemes in place. But really around the wind and solar, there's a big manufacturing potential because that also requires grid infrastructure. So we need to be putting in much more a transmission and distribution grid. So those sort of three levers of wind, uh, wind component, solar component, and uh, grid component, uh, wires, towers, substations, those are key manufacturing areas that, that should be on a multi-decade growth trajectory. You know, it's been stop-start, and that's been one of the own goals that linked to the load shedding crisis is that we haven't had this consistent spend, but we now, you know, <laughs> necessity is the mother of invention. We have to actually invest in uh, these uh, new, uh, new electricity infrastructure to stay in business, to keep the economy going. So there should be a, a sort of a multi-decade horizon around which we can build manufacturing. And then obviously, once you look at that energy transition and really link ourselves to the decarbonisation agenda that's happening globally. There are other manufacturing opportunities that can arise. So we'll see, obviously, in the, the mobility space, the electric vehicles, and we are trying to realign um, automotive manufacturing industry, which has been the one bright spot uh, in, the, in the manufacturing sector. It has remained uh, with a lot of support from government, and I think there is going to need also in this transition space some support from government. But it, there's definitely opportunity in electric mobility. And then, you know, if you build wind and solar at the sort of scale that we're talking about or need to do, and you build a little bit more, you're going to have times of the day where you're going to have really zero cost or zero marginal cost electricity. And that creates a huge opportunity in a country where, which has the three components of land, wind and sun. Uh, to become a leader in the green hydrogen space. Now, we know that green hydrogen is not a very easily exportable product at the moment. So you need to find ways to, to you know, put that into some sort of form that can be exported. Obviously, you can use it in your mines and in your own system to decarbonize the hard to abate sectors in your own economy. Um, and that, that's going to be important. But we, I think South Africa, as the ingredients to also become a superpower 
in, in green hydrogen. And really, in the, well, the way we would export that is in the form of some sort of derivative product, because it's not easy to export. So a lot of the initial products are going to be around green ammonia. But I think there's also opportunity to create uh, green direct reduced iron. And we have an advantage here in the sense that we've got a mothballed Saldana steel that it can be reignited through using green hydrogen instead of uh, coking coal um, to produce a green a DRR that can be used in mills all over the world that are looking, that have got electric arc furnace mills that are looking for that sort of ingredient that is green. And then, you know, we've also got this installed base at Sassel where we could, you know, instead of using the gray, or, uh, or, you know, the gray hydrogen that we currently produce uh, from coal is to transition towards a green hydrogen to be used in its process, Fischer-Tropsch processes, uh, to produce a green fuels and chemicals. And the obvious uh, immediate example would be sustainable aviation fuels where there's is immediate demand and there's a, p a, p a readiness to pay a price premium, uh, especially in Europe. So I think those sort of areas, that's just one, you know. And if we look at, you know, doing the same in the, say, the freight logistics area and in agriculture, mining, you know, if we link ourselves to the greener transition, critical minerals are going to be in demand. We have some of those. We've got a mining heritage and we could build a fairly large uh, critical minerals base in South and Southern Africa and build our logistics and our energy around that. So I think there's a big opportunity to really hitch our wagon to this decarbonisation agenda. And then that gives you a sort of a multi-decade horizon for big uh, manufacturing investments, probably with initial some support from the government in the form of incentives. But they should, those should wash out of the system as we become more, more competitive. So there is, an, I think, an opportunity to, to reignite our manufacturing economy around the, the green energy transition, which is also called the just energy transition, where you can create more jobs um, and uh, new livelihoods and new enterprises if we play our cards right in this area. Thank you. That's the second Tech Show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also. Don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News Daily email newsletter.